got Ricardo Fluffy Pony coming up to talk about his recent project, Tari, and about the Monero ecosystem itself. And I had the pleasure of meeting some of your Tari team at, um, at DEF CON this year, and they were great people, and I also think what you're doing is really good. So it'll be good to hear this talk, and enjoy, everybody. Thank you. Hello. That was unexpected. Hello, CCC. Welcome. So, my name is Ricardo Spagni. You may know me as Fluffy Pony. For many years, I've been the lead maintainer for Monero. Now I'm just a maintainer. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> it means I'm no longer lead. And uh, for the last little while, I've been working on a project called Tari. Uh, I started a company called Tari Labs um, with two co-founders, Dan Tari and Naveen Jain. Naveen's over there in the back if you want to go and paste him later. And uh, what I want to talk about today is what Tari is, how it's being built and architected, and uh, what that means for Monero, and why anyone in this audience should care. So to start off, what is Tari? Now, obviously, as you guys know, we already have a really cool privacy uh, cryptocurrency, pro-privacy cryptocurrency called Monero. So Tari is not um, a pro-privacy cryptocurrency in and of itself. It's a lot more than that. Tari is a privacy Trojan horse. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit in detail about how Tari is a privacy Trojan horse. But let me first explain what Tari does. So Tari is a decentralized assets protocol. Now, um, it's being architected as a merge mine sidechain with Monero, and I'll touch on that in a second. But digital assets are really interesting things because digital assets are things that live their life digitally. So a physical asset would be something like gold, right? I mean, that's a physical thing. We understand that. But a digital asset from start to finish remains digital. So examples of this are in-game currencies or in-game assets. Um, so if you play EVE Online or you play Fortnite and you have a Fortnite skin, that Fortnite skin never lives in physical form. The same goes for loyalty points. If you, you know, fly Emirates and you get Emirates loyalty points, you don't get like a physical like check in the mail that says, well done, you've got a thousand Emirates loyalty points. Those things live digitally from start to finish. Same goes for things like security tokens, uh, digital collectibles, and software licenses, of course, an interesting one as well, because you buy a piece of software, you pay your license fee because you really need this text editor or whatever, um, and then you activate it and it phones home and activates the software, and then the company shuts down in two years' time and you can't use that software anymore because it can't activate. So if those were expressed in some sort of decentralized way, you would always be able to activate that software. And this is, I mean, just as a sidebar, this is really interesting to me because there are a bunch of games that I played when I was younger um, that required online activation. And those companies have since gone defunct. And you fire up like, a, you know, whatever, Windows XP VM, and you're like, I'm going to play this game. Memories of my childhood. I'm playing Command and Conquer Red Alert. Like, you know, <laughs> such good memories. And then it's like, oh, dialing into, you know, Westwood for activation. Oh, activation failed because the website doesn't exist anymore. So there's a lot of cool stuff um, that we can do. Even like DRM, uh, recently Microsoft closed Microsoft Books and they were like, oh, all the books you bought, yeah, you don't really own them. Uh, you just like lost access to them. And that kind of sucks. I mean, DRM in general sucks, but I mean, wouldn't it be cool if we could do DRM at least in a decentralized way so that when you buy a token to access the thing that is yours because you bought access to it, that you always have access to it. So these are things that, that I think about that Tari could solve. Now, how, tar, how is Tari being built? And I think this is, you know, obviously a very critical thing. Um, Tari is uh, being architected, I said, as I said, as a merge mine sidechain with Monero. There's no white paper. Uh, over the past year and a half, we've spent a ton of time with the community, uh, with the nascent community, really building out the RFCs, building out the architecture, figuring out what this thing's supposed to look like. The only decisions that we started off with were we wanted the base layer to be Mimblewimble, and we wanted it to be written in Rust. Uh, there are very specific reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons was Mimblewimble is really scalable. I think Mimblewimble personally is a scalability technology with some privacy benefits. I don't think it's a privacy technology. Um, and uh, I think Rust is just a fantastic forward-thinking language. 
Um, and one of the main reasons that we've uh, built uh, Tari in Rust is because we didn't want to steal any resources um, from Monero. We didn't want Monero developers who are C++ developers to go, ooh, shiny, cool new toy, I want to work on that. So that's been very specific things that, uh, that we've, uh, or very specific decisions that we've taken. We also have actual use cases, um, and we have good designers building blocks, and we'll get a little bit, get into design a little bit more. Now, um, in terms of how we've architected things over the past few years, um, we've had uh, discussions on Freenode and the Tari Dev channel um, twice a week, architecture discussions. Uh, we've captured those, written them up, um, and these have been totally open. We've taken input from tons of like Monero developers, from Rust developers, from other open source communities, uh, just in terms of how we should be building this thing. And uh, we built a whole set of RFCs. Um, you can see them on rfc.tari.com. Um, and the RFCs are still open. There's still some that are work in progress. Uh, there's a, a repo on the Tari project GitHub. And uh, you can go in and you can say like, oh, I think that this should be done differently. And I mean, that's, you know, it will be done differently. Obviously, the truth is in the code. Um, so RFCs have a, a limited lifespan. At some point, the RFCs are no longer um, viable in terms of defining what happens in the code base. And so we've been um, writing code for a while. We're almost on 1,000 commits on the core project. Woo. And I think that's pretty important because things are really starting to come together uh, in terms of things like the comms layer, which is basically entirely built. Um, we're starting to be able to process transactions and blocks. We're starting to be able to um, find consensus, uh, you know, when we're merge mining and that sort of thing. So it's really coming to a, a point where uh, things are, are taking shape in a very real way. Now. I've told you a little bit about what Tari is and, uh, and you know, how it's being built, but why should Monero care? I mean, apart from the fact that it's a merge mine sidechain, like, <laughs> who cares? So the first thing I want to talk about is what Tari gets from Monero. The, we get an infusion of community members. We've had a bunch of Monero community members that have stepped up, that have gotten involved in various um, aspects of Tari. Uh, we have a, t a great technical sounding board on the Monero side because when we want to do something that, you know, when a little bit uncertain of, we can bounce that around and we can say like, hey, MRL or hey, Monero devs, what do you think about this? And then they can be like, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And we go, okay, no problem. Um, there's also a great carrying over of Monero principles. So Monero has a lot of things like on the Monero subreddit, no one talks about price. Um, and that is just, that's a principle that we set like, day zero, and uh, there's a separate subreddit where people talk about price. But newcomers don't hit the Monero subreddit and see a bunch of like to the moon memes. They don't see a bunch of people talking about the, you know, the price went up, the price went down. No one cares. People are there because they want privacy. And so with Tari, we want a lot of those principles to carry over. Skepticism Sundays is another great principle of Monero. It's a subreddit topic that happens every Sunday where people go in and talk about why Monero is going to fail. I think that's an awesome attitude to have. Let's be skeptical. Let's talk about all the problems that are facing Monero, and I want those principles to carry over to Tari. We might have to call it something other than Skepticism Sundays, like Terrible Tuesdays or something, but we'll figure it out. Um, obviously, we leverage Monero's security model because we're merge mined. Uh, and then you just heard from Hashed on atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero. So we have um, similar ideas either to use that directly uh, or there are a couple of blind merge mining um, atomic swap based uh, mechanisms that would allow us to have atomic swaps between Monero and Tari. Uh, now, what Monero, what Monero gets from Tari right now, and this has been happening over the past um, 12 to 18 months, Tari Labs currently plays, pays for the Monero CDN. Um, the CDN uh, is very important because the CDN that we use is expensive. It's like $4,500 a month, but they have 90, over 19 points of presence in China. So that means when a Chinese citizen wants to download Monero, they don't go through the Great Firewall. They download it locally in China without ever touching the Great Firewall. And that's pretty important, especially for open access to uh, citizens of a country where the governance is, let's say, a little bit overreaching. We also have a slush fund that we use to contribute to CCS proposals. So uh, we try and use that um, to, to finish proposals that are struggling. Uh, we also try and give it an injection to new proposals. So um, when someone comes and says like, hey, I'd like to do this thing, or I'd like to spend another three months working on Monero, and it's going to cost X amount, then we try and give as much as we can out of that slush fund. 
We're also strong supporters of the MRL. We believe that the Monero Research Lab is the lifeblood and future um, of Monero because privacy is a cat and mouse game. You don't finish privacy. You don't go, well, we're done and now it's private and the NSA can't touch it. You keep pushing and they keep pushing back. So we've sponsored things like biannual uh, MRL workshops where members of the MRL have gotten together um, in a central location and uh, been able to really workshop uh, new ideas and brainstorm things about things that could advance Monero's privacy and scalability. Now, why should anyone care? I mean, this is cool. You know, Monero gets some stuff. Tari gets some stuff. The thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, um, Tari is a Trojan private, ho private horse. Uh, oh, sorry, privacy Trojan horse, that thing. And the reason is because Monero is amazing, but it's evident now that people either won't use it or can't use it. Now, we can fix um, the UI problem and the UX problem. There was a great talk on that, um, on some of the advancements that are being made uh, to Monero UX. But the reality is most people don't realize they need privacy. This is not a thing we're going to fix. You know, you can go like door to door knocking on people's door and being like, you need privacy. And they're going to go like, no, I don't. I don't do anything wrong. And it's true, they probably don't need strong privacy until they do. So I've spent the past five years advocating for people to understand why they need privacy. And I just haven't seen a shift in the market. I've seen a shift in some things, like I've seen Apple start to embrace, embrace privacy. That's great. That's fantastic. But I'm not seeing that wave that I was hoping for. And so we need to trick people into using privacy enhancing tools. And one of these companies that are doing this really successfully, as I said, Apple's one of them. They're tricking people into using privacy enhancing tools by making like a device that's really easy to use that people want. And they don't realize that they're getting the benefits of strong privacy. They just want the latest iPhone. Uh, same goes for like Mozilla. Firefox is starting to do really good things on the privacy side. Um, and people just use Firefox because it's a good browser. They're not using Firefox because they go like, oh, I need, you know, a Tor tab. They're going, I need Firefox because like Chrome sucks or, you know, like Google's evil. And so therefore, um, or like, you know, my system administrator pre-installed Firefox and hates Edge. And that's great. They're tricking people into using privacy enhancing tools. So Tari can get them into an ecosystem where Monero is accessible to them. How? I'd like to show you a video. And this video is of an example of some of the stuff that we're designing, some of the resources that we're bringing to bear uh, to make Monero accessible. So this is an example of digital collectibles on Tari. It obviously doesn't exist yet. So imagine a Monero Enterprise Alliance app. Just imagine it, I don't know. And you have this cool collectible in your Monero Enterprise Alliance app. This is a cool flaming Monero. It's the year 2023 edition. I don't know why we chose that year, it's so weird. Um, and you can see it's got an estimated value in Monero based on its rarity and a number of other factors based on how much people are willing to pay for this particular one. Um, it's one in 500, so we're able to do um, a, a, a cryptographically, we're able to prove uh, how many have actually been issued. Um, and that's obviously pretty important as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is legendary because it's one in 500. There could be different classes of, uh, of collectibles, but this one's legendary. And then we can set rules. So in this particular asset, we've set a bunch of rules like um, Fluffy Pony and the NSA will receive 5% of trades because we want to keep them happy. Um, collectibles may be used in authorized applications, especially those owned and operated by state actors. Because wouldn't it be funny if the NSA had to use a Monero thing? Uh, and then iconic edition collectibles may be redeemed for a meet and greet with Fluffy Pony. Hey, what's up? Um, so these are examples of rules. Obviously, these are jokes. But the reality is, rules like being able to earn 5% uh, on trades, that's a pretty like big deal. And I'll explain why in a second. You see, a lot of the things that... that you build digital collectible engines around or you build things like in-game assets and in-game tokens around um, are based on uh, things that are held by copyright holders. Now copyright holders, especially in the USA but also in uh, Europe, are incredibly powerful. They have been able to extend copyright law in the USA that had lasted for 120 years after the creation, even if the person who created it died. Now I mean that's just nuts. I mean that is a crazy change in regulation. How have they been able to do that? They've been able to do that because we're talking about incredibly powerful companies. We're talking about companies that own artists, that own 
movies, that own TV series, that own musicians. Um, they own, you know, we're talking about really big companies. So when they go, copyright law, yeah, 40 years isn't enough. We need 120. Then regulators go, cool, rubber stamp, doof. Now imagine, imagine if those companies use Tari. And we're able to, to facilitate a lot of that um, because of the way we're building Tari and because of the things that we're building on top of Tari. Now imagine if those companies go like, yes, we want to use Tari. They're going to go, hey, but we want to do so privately because they don't want to expose what the 5% is that they're getting on that rake. They, don't, they certainly don't want to pay tax. So they're going to start embracing a lot of the privacy aspects of Tari and of Monero. And they will start pushing regulation that is pro-privacy because it serves their interests, because they're making money from things that are built on top of Tari. Now, that's not all. Because Tari believes, and the Tari Labs at least, believes that Monero is a critical part of this infrastructure. So we're committed to giving radical support to Monero research and development. And one of the ways that we hope to do this is by creating something called a dev center. So dev centers, we, we hope, will be physical. In, uh, in, in other words, in several cities around the world, there will be actual dev centers. And then online as well for people that aren't able to go and uh, go to a physical dev center or don't live near one or whatever. Um, researchers and developers, uh, will, we hope, will be able to apply for grants. And they will go, yeah, OK, there's this really cool thing I want to build. It's a mobile wallet for Monero that uses fuzzy waffle technology. Um, and in order to do that, it's going to take me six months, and it's going to cost x. Um, and I needed my designer guy to work with me as well. And then there'll be a grant committee, um, which will we'll set it up as something that's like really broad. They'll be able to, and, uh, to facilitate these grants, figure out how they're apportioned. Um, this is, of course, work in progress. We don't have like the perfect model for it. It's a few years out at least if it's going to happen. But we think that this could be a really cool way of pushing things forward. The CCS is incredibly powerful, um, and we don't expect this to replace the CCS on any way or on any level. But we think this could be a really cool way for people to be able to bring teams together and say, hey, I want to build this thing for the Monero ecosystem or part of the Monero core software. It's going to take me 12 months. It's going to take me 18 months. I need to have like the ability to do that and know that I'm going to get paid. My team needs to know they're going to get paid. So there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do with dev centers. So I hope that this gave you guys a bit of insight into what we're doing with Monero um, and Tari, how the two ecosystems interact and interoperate, and why this is important, how Tari can be a private horse, a, tro a privacy Trojan horse. I'll get it right eventually. Um, and how that can really bring uh, privacy enhancing technologies into the lives of ordinary people, or normies as we call them, and how we can trick them into using privacy tools. Thank you very much. I'll take a few questions. We have a few minutes still. Oh, good, no questions. Oh, that's the best. Cool, there's no questions. Awesome. All right. Catch me later if you guys want to ask anything. I'm happy to talk. Thank you.